Now, we all enjoy a bit of a satirical humour now and then, and Babylon B is always worth checking out. Last week, the US hard-left Democrat Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib, Tlaib tried to play down the genocidal anti-Semitic slogan from the river to the sea by saying it was simply an aspirational cry for freedom, to which the Babylon Bee responded with this bit of satire. Rashida Tlaib says Heil Hitler was just an aspirational call for freedom. OK, not bad, and there have been plenty of other comparisons between Hamas, pro-Palestinian protests, and the Nazis. Some funny, some less so. Now, the gag always used to be that whoever invoked the Nazis first in a political argument lost by default. And it's usually true. But over the last few weeks, alas, that is no longer the case. The bloodthirsty massacres of October 7th and the resulting outbreak of Jew hatred around the world bear all the hallmarks of Hitler and the Nazis. We have seen the Star of David graffitied on Jewish homes in, of all places, Berlin. We have seen a terrifying increase in physical attacks on Jews, including here in Australia and overseas. Some have resulted in death. No wonder Jews are getting very, very nervous. All the images um, that we grew up with, swastikas, harassment, um, stickers, and boycotts of Jewish businesses we're now seeing uh, here in, in Australia, and it is um, deeply disturbing. I'm now asking myself sometimes, do I need to hide my Jewishness to be safe? Um, are my children safe? The other day, Israel's ambassador to the UN felt so sickened by events that he wore a Nazi-era yellow star. This week, the front page of the Australian newspaper contained a letter, and good on them for putting it on the front page, a letter from 100 Australian Jewish survivors of the Holocaust, writing a plea for an end to anti-Semitism in Australia and for Australians to stand with the Jewish people. They were writing it on the 85th anniversary of the evil night known as Kristallnacht, Crystal Night so-called because of all the broken glass everywhere. Kristallnacht was, of course, November the 9th, 1938, when Hitler's thugs, including the Hitler Youth Movement, yes, kids, smashed, shattered and looted Jewish homes, shops and businesses. Mob rule broke out, looting, rapes, suicides. Thousands of synagogues and buildings were torched and vandalised. Despicably, as Hugh Green reported in the UK Daily Telegraph at the time, quote, racial hatred and hysteria seem to have taken complete hold of otherwise decent people. I saw fashionably dressed women clapping their hands and screaming with glee, while respectable middle-class mothers held up their babies to see the fun in inverted commas. Nowadays, of course, they just hold up their iPhones. We saw echoes of the same mass insanity following October 7th and indeed during October 7th. The glee with which women, children were tortured, babies deca decapitated, the desecrated bodies of raped and mutilated Jews then paraded around Gaza and the sheer joy and enthusiasm of the crowds who ran after them and indeed the crowds who cheered them on around the world. Far from comparisons with Hitler and the Nazis being extreme or exaggerated, they are now, if anything, understated. And a warning, some may find this next video distressing. Crowds beating the dead body of a Jew in Gaza, and cheering. Is it really all that surprising? History suggests that the comparisons between the modern anti-Semitism fueled by pro-Palestinian sentiments and Hitler's anti-Semitism are no coincidence. 
Meet Haj Amin al Husseini. According to author David Dallin in his essay, Hitler's Mufti, quote, it is possible to trace modern Islamic anti-Semitism back along a number of different historical and intellectual threads, but no matter which one you choose, they all seem to pass at one point or another through the hands of one figure, Hitler's Mufti, Haj Amin al-Husseini, the viciously anti-Semitic Grand Mufti of Jerusalem and the leader of Muslim fundamentalists in Palestine, who resided in Berlin as a welcome guest of the Nazis throughout the years of the Holocaust. As David Darlin writes, from his earliest years, from his earliest years, Al Husseini was a ferocious opponent of Jewish immigration to Palestine with an unrelenting hatred of the Jews and the British. His career as an anti-Semitic agitator and terrorist began on April 4, 1920, when he and his followers went on a murderous rampage, attacking Jews on the streets and looting Jewish stores. He was subsequently convicted by a military tribunal of inciting anti-Semitic violence that resulted in the killing of five Jews and the wounding of 211 others. On August 23, 1929, Al-Husseini led a massacre of 60 Jews in Hebron and another 45 in Safad. In late March 1933, Al-Husseini contacted the German Consul General in Jerusalem and requested German help in eliminating Jewish settlements in Palestine, offering in exchange a pan-Islamic jihad in alliance with Germany against Jews around the world. On November 28, 1941, Husseini met for the first time with Adolf Hitler. As another author has correctly argued, quote, Al Husseini owes his place in history to this meeting where he offered to raise an Arab legion to help carry out Hitler's extermination of the Jews. Quote, it is hardly accidental that the beginning of the systematic physical destruction of European Jewry by Hitler's Third Reich roughly coincided with the Mufti's arrival in the Axis camp. Joseph B. Schettmann pointed out in his 1965 book, The Mufti and the Fuhrer. Quote, the Mufti's close ties to Hitler and his total embrace of Hitler's final solution, concludes another author, provides the common thread linking past to present. At the Nuremberg trials, Adolf Eichmann's deputy, Dieter Wislensini, was even more explicit, quote, the Mufti was one of the initiators of the systematic extermination of European Jewry and had been a collaborator and advisor of Eichmann and Himmler in the execution of his plan. He was one of Eichmann's best friends and had constantly incited him to accelerate the extermination measures. This is a quote. I heard him say that, accompanied by Eichmann, he had visited incognito the gas chamber of Auschwitz. On his visit to Auschwitz, Al Husseini reportedly, quote, admonished the guards running the gas chambers to work more diligently. There are already photos of the Grand Mufti, Hitler, and Himmler circulating the internet but the Nazis in these photos are less high profile. Kedem speculates that they include Arthur Seyss, Inquart the Austrian Reichskommissar of the Occupied Netherlands, Fritz Groba, Germany's ambassador to Iraq, and Iraqi politician Rashid Ali Al-Gailani. Allegedly, the Grand Mufti's ties to the Nazis pressured the British to oppose Zionism during World War II under fear that the Arabs would side with the Axis powers. What a vile figure. But alas, that was just the beginning. As David Dallin also writes, quote, after the defeat of the Axis powers, Haj Amin al-Husseini escaped indictment as a war criminal at Nuremberg by fleeing to Egypt, where he received political asylum and where shortly after his arrival, he met 
the young Yasser Arafat, a teenager then living in Cairo. Arafat's mother was the daughter of Al Husseini's first cousin. Arafat soon became a devoted protege of the Grand Mufti, who brought a former Nazi commando to Egypt to teach Arafat and others how to fight. In 1969, for example, the PLO, the Palestinian Libera Liberation Organization run by Arafat, recruited two former Nazi instructors, Eric Altern, a leader of the Gestapo's Jewish Affairs Section, and Willy Berner, an SS officer in the Malthausen extermination camp. In a major address, as recently as April 1985, Yasser Arafat said he took, quote, immense pride in being the Mufti's student and emphasized that the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, quote, is continuing the path the Mufti set. Arafat, of course, is the man who became the leader of the Palestinians and rejected Israel's offer, many offers of a Palestinian state. According to historian Robert S. Vistrick, quote, there is currently a culture of hatred in the Arab Middle East which has not been seen since the heyday of Nazi Germany. Now we come full circle. Here are a group of pro-Palestinian radicals chanting, just last week, only one solution. There is only one solution! There is only one solution! There is only one solution. Were they deliberately referencing the final solution? You decide. But at the same march, the words Holocaust 2.0 were scrawled on the pavement at a Western university. And if that's not quite specific enough for you, here's a radicalised pro-Palestinian using her own children in a sick sketch on social media. That may be her sick fantasy, but here is the reality, and I apologize again for how disturbing the footage is. I'll only play 10 seconds of what is several minutes long from the aftermath of the massacre at, ironically, the Peace Festival. <laughs> And those blurred images were, of course, dead bodies. So, we either learn from history, those who fail to learn from history are condemned to repeat it. So please, <clears throat> let, let us learn. But let me end on an optimistic note. Do all Arabs hate Jews? Of course not. Especially those Arabs who actually live in Israel. My mother was, is penniless and illiterate. She doesn't know reading and writing because her parents didn't believe that women have the right to go to school. It's not Israel. I probably would be illiterate, penniless, herding sheep somewhere in Galil, right? But I have electrical engineering degree. I have master's from Stanford University. And I have, and I have my rights to live my life the way that I wanted to live them. Israel gave us everything that it could give us, even though we were Arabs. And people are talking about apartheid and ethnic genocide. It just does, doesn't match the truth. It doesn't match the reality. They need to go and read the facts. And it's funny that sometimes it comes from intelligence students at elite universities saying this kind of nonsense.